Well, this talk focuses on the results of archaeological excavations that took place on the site of a large Augustinian Priory and Hospital in East London. The Priory was originally called St Mary Without Bishopsgate, although it came to be known more widely as St Mary's Spittal, reflecting its function as a hospital. Thus, the area around it became better known as Spitalfields. The first mention of the Priory in the documentary sources comes from 1197 and states that it was founded by Walter and Rosaya Brunus. It was one of an increasing number of charitable institutions built in response to growing urban populations in England during the 12th century. Chief amongst the functions of the Priory was to care for the sick, the poor, the homeless, the elderly and pilgrims. In medieval England, it was thought that outward signs of disease reflected spiritual neglect. In other words, those who fell ill were thought to have committed a sin. We would certainly not have recognised anyone we would identify as a medical doctor at St Mary's Spittal. Unlike modern hospitals, treatment prioritised caring for the soul. The Priory, which in this map is near the northeast corner, here, was situated on Bishop's Gate, which ran down through here, and it lay to the south of Holywell Priory and to north of St Mary Bethlehem, an area which we're excavating at the moment, in fact we've just finished. St Mary Spittal lay outside the city walls in a prime location to attract pilgrims and other travellers entering or leaving London. Those staying at the Priory would thus be close to the city, but at the same time avoid the densely occupied areas within. Uh, the view on the next slide is taken from the position of approximately this arrow here, looking north. Okay. This is Wingard's panorama of London, which provides a view of the city from the south bank of the Thames, looking north. It dates to about 1538 and shows the tower in the foreground on the right, down here, and St Mary's Spittal in the distance, up here. Uh, Bishop's Gate is also leading out of the city walls towards St Mary's Spittal. Uh, the panorama gives us some idea of the dense occupation within the city walls and the, the wide open spaces beyond. Uh, as you can see, the Priory Church was substantial, and at its height, this was one of the largest hospitals in England. Now, the reason I'm talking about St Mary's Spittal today is that it was founded just to the north of a pre-existing burial ground that was used as an overflow and emergency cemetery by the City of London. And although this cemetery was incorporated into the Priory precinct, it continued to be used by the city and later by the Priory as well, up to the dissolution. The main excavations on the site of the Priory ground sorry, are just here in the foreground in front of the market. Spitalfields Market is here. Uh, these excavations were carried out by Museum of London Archaeology and took place between 1999 and 2002, during which time approximately 10,500 human skeletons were recovered. Now, this came as a bit of a shock to Chris Thomas, the, uh, the archaeologist in charge, as the original estimate was only around 4,000. Um, however, this was a very large and well-funded project, which included a great deal of redevelopment as the City of London pushed ever eastward towards Brick Lane. Unfortunately, we were able to recover all the individuals. Calculations based on burial density and the area of land occupied by the cemetery suggest that the original burial population was about 18,000. Many of the lost skeletons were probably disturbed during the building of the western half of the Victorian market, which you can see in the centre of this image. So if we're looking eastwards here, here's the market. This western half has been pulled down and replaced with, with new stores. Uh, here in the background, this is uh, Christchurch Spitalfields. 
Brick Lane runs north-south along here. And then the background, you can just see Canary Wharf. Now, for the next slide, if you imagine you're up in the tower of Christchurch Spitalfield looking back this way, we have a reconstruction of the Priory Church, which was excavated previously. Now, uh, before I go any further, as I work for MOLA, I should acknowledge the numerous past and present colleagues who worked on this project, including the field archaeologists on site, the human bone processors, and the osteologists. In particular, Brian Connell, Bill White, Amy Gray-Jones, and Rebecca Redfern. Now, previous excavations, the northwest of the cemetery, outlined a plan of the Priory Church, as well as the associated buildings within the complex. The north and south ranges of the church were probably utilised as hospital dormitories containing about 60 beds, with one range for men and one for women, divided by curtains. As the hospital grew, a two-storey extension was added to the west side of the north range. So here we have the south range and the north range here, and then you can just see the roof here, just to the north of the main tower, the extension of the dormitory here. And this is Bishop's Gate going up to the top of the, top of the screen there. The extension was probably built sometime around 1320 to 1350. This increased the number of beds to perhaps 120. The capacity of the hospital would probably have been higher than this as it was common for at such institutions to fit two or three patients to each bed. John Stowe claimed that it had 180 beds, making it the largest hospital in London. The burial ground itself was furnished with a cemetery chapel in the early 14th century. You can see that down at the bottom of the screen here. There was also a pulpit cross to the north of the chapel here, where people gathered to hear sermons on religious days. When excavated, the upper floor of the cemetery chapel had gone, but the lower floor, which had been used as a charnel house, survived. Following excavation, the chapel was preserved in situ, so you can still see it behind glass, below pavement level in the piazza to the west of the existing market. This is just a, a reconstructed plan of the uh, Priory complex. Uh, just briefly, here is Bishop's Gate leading out of the city, going up to the north on the left-hand side of the screen here. Here's the gatehouse. Uh, the original infirmary was probably here, divided by curtains, probably male and female either side. And then here's the infirmary extension just to the, uh, to the west of the main church. Uh, and here, of course, is the area of the burial ground with the charnel house and the pulpit cross. By their very nature, cemeteries are notoriously difficult to date stratigraphically. People will keep digging holes in them. And you tend to end up with what archaeologists call cemetery soil, a thick, homogenous layer of soil within which relative dating of graves can be difficult. However, at St Mary's Spittle, we were fortunate that burials could be divided into four periods of use based on stratigraphic evidence backed up by targeted radiocarbon dating. This means that as well as being one of the largest burial ground excavations, it is hopefully one of the best dated. We know that it was used for burial for at least 400 years and was finally closed during the dissolution. Now, as well as the phasing, the burials were divided into burial types for analysis. Attritional burials included all those that were believed to be the result of normal rates of mortality consisting chiefly of organised, spaced rows of individual burial plots, known as burial type A. In some cases, two or three bodies were buried together in horizontal rows, and these were included in burial type B. In other cases, there were vertically stacked or shaft burials, all interred at the same time, usually three or four bodies deep. These were included in burial type C, and may have been dug in response to small-scale epidemics at the Priory. The other burial type, burial type D, 
consisted of mass burial pits believed to have resulted from sudden increases in mortality due to catastrophic events. Some of the attritional burials were contained within stone-lined tombs. You can see here to the left, this is a good example, down here, under excavation. Uh, these clustered on the western side of the cemetery near the church and probably contained higher status individuals, although not sufficiently important to qualify for, church within, sorry, qualify for burial within the church itself. Other single inhumations were found with papal bullae and others, presumably priests, with chalices and patterns. And here's an example here with the chalice and the pattern surviving just above the neck. There were 497 multi-layered mass burials within large pits, typically containing between 8 and 45 bodies, seemingly the result of increased rates of mortality during some form of catastrophic episode. The mass pits were simple earth-cut constructions. They tended to be about 1.9 metres long, uh, 1.2 to 1.6 metres wide, and about 1.5 metres deep, so about to the level of the shoulder of the grave digger. As with most of the other burials in the cemetery, individuals in the mass pits were probably dressed in shrouds with minimal use of coffins. The burials appeared well-ordered and consistent alignment of bodies and no evidence of individuals being thrown in from the sides of the pit. The majority of bodies were aligned with heads to the west and feet facing east, conforming to Christian tradition. However, in some cases, children were placed at the foot end of the grave, laid out north-south, apparently to make optimum use of the space within. As I mentioned, the evidence from the mass burial pits shows that the dead were probably victims of episodes of high mortality. Rapid burial was a priority, but bodies were still treated with respect and given Christian rights. The orderly nature of the graves reflects a certain degree of care. Equally, there is no doubt that there were pressures of both time and space. The cemetery filled up very quickly, reducing the amount of land available for burial. We can see this when we look at two periods of burial in particular, periods 15 and 16. At the end of period 15, a large number of pits were dug in regularly spaced rows. Then, only a short time later, at the beginning of period 16, a new phase of pits was dug, and these were squeezed into the spaces between the period 15 pits. It seems the burial ground was filling up fast, and space was at a premium. The grave diggers tried to avoid the earlier burials, but were not always successful. Some of the period 15 pits were disturbed by the digging of the later period 16 pits. We see this in both the truncation of the earlier pits and the redeposition of bone from these into the backfill of the new pits. Interestingly, the redeposited bone often took the form of whole articulated limbs, showing that they were still intact and quite possibly fleshed when the disturbance took place. This reinforces the impression that little time separated the mass burials of period 15 from those of period 16 as the bodies had not been in the ground long enough for the soft tissue to fully decompose. Again, I don't believe the disturbance of these burials signifies a lack of respect for the dead. It simply reflects pressures of time and space. And here at the top of the screen, just here, you can see the top half of a number of skeletons. Basically, here are the, the trunk, the torso, and the, the lower arms are here. Uh, and from the pelvis downwards, it, the bodies are missing, basically. And what's happened, this is a period 15 pit here that's been cut by the new cut here for the new period 16 burial. And the bone that was disturbed from here was redeposited amongst the bones of the new burials here. So really quite significant disturbance of previous burials that hadn't taken place very long before. The outer areas of the cemetery to the south and east, so over here to the east and down here to the south, uh, the mass pits are shown in red in this case, 
Uh, this is where the, the, most of the mass pits were located. So at the, the outer parts of the cemetery, away from the church, which was, which was up here in the northwest. <clears throat> they still labelled in consecrated ground. It was just a long way from the church. And this reflects a form of sacred geography, where the pits were dug in the least sacred part of the cemetery. It also probably served for practical purposes, reducing the amount of disruption to the running of the priory and its own burial ground. Of the 497 mass burial pits, 448 were found in periods 15 and 16, with many falling close to that boundary between the two periods. So what caused such high levels of mortality at this time? Here we must look at the archaeological evidence, including that from the bones themselves. And one possible reason for burying large numbers of individuals in a single event is the disposal of the dead following a battle. There are precedents for this at other medieval sites, of course, such as Towton, where significant evidence of perimortem weapon injury was found in the skeletons. Perimortem meaning around the time of death. Now, in this case, on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see an example of healed blunt force trauma. This is basically the, the front of the skull here, the rear of the skull here. So we're talking about the left parietal, about in this region up here. And there's a very large impression in the head, you can probably see here, and with a radiating line coming down here. But the main thing to notice is that the edges of the wound are very, very smooth. And this shows that by the time this person died, the, the wound had fully healed, and it may have healed several years before death, and obviously had no direct impact on, on the life of this person, as in it didn't kill them. Um, and we can contrast that with this skull on the right-hand side. Um, this is the front of the skull here, the back of the skull down here, and this lesion here is right on top, right on top of the skull. And you can see the difference between the two lesions. This hasn't got the smooth edges. You can see down here as well uh, in the blown up example. It hasn't got smooth edges. It's got very, very sharp, cracked edges. There's no sign of new bone growth, no sign of, of, of any remodeling at all. Um, you can see here, actually, the sagittal suture that comes back down here has been slightly cracked open. And actually, the line of force from the blow uh, went all the way down the back of the head and down to the occipital and actually cracked open the foramen magnum at the base of the skull. Um, the skull is fairly tough in life and it takes quite the force to, to, to cause breakage, especially in the stronger areas at the, at the top here. Um, so all indications are that this individual died at or very quickly after they <coughs> suffered they suffered this trauma. Uh, the significant thing is at St Mary's Spittle is while we have some examples of healed blunt force trauma and sharp force trauma, there are very few examples of perimortem trauma. Uh, so we know that the mass pits did not ca contain victims of battle. Additionally, if one assumes that the majority of combatants would be men, then one would expect a high proportion of male bodies within the pits, which is not the case. The numbers of men and females, in fact, are very similar. Uh, of course, we do not have to search far for catastrophic events in medieval England. Most notorious was the Black Death, caused by the Yersinia pestis pathogen, better known as plague, which killed as many as 30 to 50% of London's population, perhaps 40,000 people or more, from 1348 to 1350. However, the dating from St Mary's Biddle revealed that only a few small pits containing six or seven bodies per pit perhaps 200 people in total, were contemporary with the mid-14th century epidemic. Perhaps we should not be surprised at this, as we know that the majority of Black Death victims were sent to new cemeteries at West, West Smithfield and East Smithfield, open specifically to deal with the Great Pestilence. In fact, recent excavations of Black Death victims at West Smithfield revealed that at least some of the dead were buried in single graves. This may seem surprising, but perhaps mass burial pits 
were only employed when the plague was at its peak. It certainly suggests that by the time of the Black Death, London was more capable of burying large numbers of dead in a more efficient manner than they were the century before. Uh, just quickly to explain what we've got here, um, this was a grout shaft opened up by Crossrail as part of their works at Farringdon. And uh, we knew that it was going to be dug into Charterhouse Square, which is very famously is known as a uh, Black Death burial ground. Uh, so what we found, actually, was uh, not just this layer of burials, but two other layers as well beneath. So it seems that we have, uh, from the radiocarbon dating, we have burials from the original outbreak of the plague and then reuse of the burial ground uh, during later outbreaks of plague. So it's the first time we've really seen this phasing. They went back to the cemetery, and I suppose if you already have a, a cemetery that's used, used for plague victims, you might as well go back and use it next time the plague, uh, the plague comes around. Um, and the reason we know this is because we did DNA testing on the individuals and found that uh, individuals from all three phases had been exposed to Yersinia pestis. So a very interesting site. Okay, so um, how do we go about looking at the effects of famine on a population? Uh, we know that from some of the radiocarbon data at St Mary's Spittle, we had quite a few from uh, the Great Famine, which was a bit earlier in the Black Death, 1315 to 1317. Um, we know that it was a very high number of London's population that died, perhaps between 10 25 percent. Um, and it's estimated that some of these must have been uh, buried at St Mary's Spittle. Uh, looking at the effects of famine on populations in the past, well, uh, we can look at several things. Um, as often in archaeology, uh, we tend to employ a holistic approach, working with and combining different strands of evidence to fill in the gaps in our knowledge. We can read contemporary documentary sources and accounts of other historical famines, such as the Great Irish Famine in the mid-19th century, uh, we can also study evidence of variations in funerary practice, such as the opening of emergency burial grounds, to cope with increased mortality rates. Osteologists can compare attritional burial samples with those of suspected famine sufferers to investigate whether males or females are most affected and at what ages. We can also look for any signs of disease or malnutrition prevalent in the famine sa sample that might show it was the weakest who succumbed first. Bioarchaeology, which embraces recent advances in biomolecular techniques, such as ancient DNA and stable isotope analysis, is an exciting field opening up many different areas of study of these past populations. What did people eat? Where did they come from? And what diseases were they exposed to? We can also look at the effects of modern famine, for which, unfortunately, there is ample data. As such events tend to occur in poor agricultural groups, there is some validity in looking at the effects of famine on fertility and mortality and investigating whether archaeological evidence reflects similar patterns. At this point, we should look at the reasons why populations suffering food shortages become ill. Insufficient food intake leads to malnutrition, or more correctly, undernutrition, where there are too few nutrients to maintain normal bodily function. This can cause a number of somewhat predictable outcomes, such as tiredness, reduced physical energy, mental confusion and impaired immunity, leading to increased disease and mortality, particularly in vulnerable groups, such as the very young. Reduced physical energy and mental capacity can compound any existing problems by reducing effort expended on maintaining adequate hygiene and childcare. Reduced access to food leads people to resort to poor quality diets and unfamiliar or improperly prepared fare. Medieval sources report that in times of famine, people ate tree bark, shoe leather and horse meat. Consumption of spoiled and diseased foods also increased, 
leading to gastrointestinal disease, including dysentery and diarrhea, major killers in modern famines, particularly of the very young. So what effect would all this have on a population? Work by Julia Beaumont at Bradford University on stable isotopes has shown that high nitrogen levels within the dentine of infants' teeth may be a response to the effects of their mother's inadequate diet during pregnancy. In effect, the mother's own bodily resources are drained in order to grow and provide milk for their young. This obviously has consequences for the mother, but in times of famine, people tend not to die of starvation per se. Most are killed by microorganisms, taking advantage of weakened human hosts. The depression of the immune system caused by low nutrition encourages opportunistic infections such as measles. Such infections can spread rapidly in weakened populations and have a catastrophic effect on communities. It is often the case with any form of population crisis that it is not the initial source of disaster that has the greatest effect, but rather the diseases that then take hold within weakened groups with reduced access to resources. However, it can be difficult to differentiate famine populations through traditional osteological methods. Many associated diseases are acute in nature in that they act over short periods of time, too brief for the types of bone changes we study to occur. It is also true that microorganisms that can decimate famine populations can also be found in non-famine groups. For example, malnutrition may aggravate pre-existing chronic conditions such as tuberculosis. But how do we dif differentiate between famine and non-famine sufferers of the disease? It is hoped that new techniques being applied to the St. Mary Spittal skeletal assemblage by Jelena Beckvillick and Rebecca Redfern at the Centre for Human Bioarchaeology here at the Museum of London will help us to understand the differences between famine and non-famine groups. So to recap, St Mary's Spittal was found to have a large assemblage of emergency burials, possibly the result of the Great Famine in the second day, decade of the 13th century. Down here. However, when we received the full radiocarbon dates, we found that while we could attribute about 1,400 of the estimated original catastrophic burials to the Great Famine at the beginning of the 14th century, the majority, about 3,500, were at least 50 years earlier, around the middle of the 13th century, effectively right at the end of period 16 and the beginning of period, sorry, right at the end of period 15 and the beginning of period 16, the two largest phases of mass burial use. As we saw earlier, these two phases were separated by only a short period of time. Now, this was a bit of a puzzle, uh, as it was not something we were expecting. It's true that famine and pestilence were no strangers to medieval London, but to have such a high concentration of burial at this time was a real surprise. So we started looking at documentary sources, some of which were kindly forwarded to me by John Clark, Museum of London Curator Emeritus. This bore fruit in that we found some interesting entries from St Albans monk Matthew Paris in his Chronica Maiora. Uh, in 1258, he recorded that the north wind prevailed for several months, and when April, May, and great part of June were over, scarcely a small, rare flower or shooting germ appeared, whence the hope of harvest was uncertain. Innumerable multitudes of poor people died, and their bodies were found lying all about, swollen from want and livid, five or six together. He went on to say... And when many dead bodies were found, large and capacious pits were made in the cemeteries in which the bodies of very many people were placed. Nor did those who had homes to dare to harbour the sick and dying for fear of infection. The pestilence was immense, insufferable. It attacked the poor particularly. In London alone, 15,000 of the poor perished. And we have another contemporary source, the Chronicles of the Mayors and Sheriffs for 1258. 1257 to 1258, 
which stated, in this year, there was a failure of the crops, upon which failure a famine ensued, to such a degree that the people from the villages resorted to the city for food. And there, upon the famine sacks waxing still greater, many thousand persons perished. Many thousands more, too, would have died of hunger had not corn then just arrived from Almain. So had we found a historical reference to the catastrophe that led to the creation of the emergency burial ground at St Mary's Spittle? And if so, what could have caused the apparent extremes of weather that had such a devastating effect on crops? Well, we know that large volcanic eruptions can cause dramatic climatic variation. So we found a very useful website, that of the Global Volcanism Programme, hosted by the Smithsonian. Uh, although the format of the website has changed over the years, it used to have a very neat page where you could type in a date and retrieve information for all the eruptions from that year. Uh, for example, if you typed in AD 79 here, you would bring up the Roman Vesuvius eruption. So I typed in 1257 and 1258, and found nothing. Um, <laughs> however, I then realised that the search only returned information for eruptions with known sources. If it was unclear exactly which volcano had erupted, it was not included in the results of any search. So I only took a minute to discover that indeed there was geological evidence of an eruption, source unknown, from 1257 or 1258. This evidence was recorded in nine northern hemisphere and six Antarctic ice cores. It was also found in lake bed sediments from Lake Malawi. The stratospheric sulfate load of the eruption was calculated to be eight times that of Krakatoa and twice that of Tambora. And Tambora, we know, caused a year without a summer and also caused failed harvests in Britain and Ireland. The VEI, or Volcanic Explosivity Index, of the eruption had a rating of 7, which equates to what is known as a super-colossal event. These occur about once every 1,000 years. In fact, this was the largest volcanic eruption of the last millennium and one of the most substantial of the Holocene, covering the last 12,000 years. Such an event would have created what is known as a dry fog of water vapour and gas in the stratosphere, reducing incoming levels of solar radiation and cooling the surface of the Earth. The disruption of atmospheric circulation would cause increased precipitation, thereby threatening crops and raising the risk of famine and high mortality in human populations. Now, it emerged that scientists had been searching for the source of this particular eruption for over 30 years. Previous suggested locations included El Chichon in Mexico and Quilatoa in Ecuador. Finally, just a year after we published St Mary's Spittle, the source of the eruption was identified as the Somalis volcano in Indonesia. So, when all the evidence is taken together, it seems that the emergency burial ground at St Mary's Spittle may have been a localised example of a much greater phenomenon. To a large extent, it is only by luck that we can make this connection. St Mary's Spittle was a very large, well-funded project with the resources to carry out a comprehensive programme of radiocarbon dating. Otherwise, without accurate dating, we may simply have assumed that these were Black Death or Great Famine victims. Perhaps with increased dating of medieval burial grounds, we will find further evidence of catastrophic assemblages from this time. This is the first archaeological evidence of a 1257 volcano, and it's a good example of the unusually broad scope of research with which we can become engaged. It's amazing to think that evidence of such a massive global natural disaster can exist in a small area of London. As for the people of the medieval city, they could never have imagined that their suffering was part of a truly global event originating on the other side of the world. Thank you very much. <laughs>